Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our participants from Australia, the U.S., and Europe. And welcome to the closing plenary session of the ESIG 2020 Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop, which has been held online during the month of June. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As most of you know, we were originally planning to do our annual forecasting and markets workshop in Denver this month, but due to the coronavirus situation, we found it necessary to move the workshop online. We have a really great set of speakers from around the world today, representing North America, Europe, and Australia. While it's 10 p.m. in Europe right now, it's 6 a.m. tomorrow morning in Australia. So a really big thanks to our speakers and participants from Europe and Australia, as well as the U.S. Being 4 a.m. in China right now, it's a little more difficult to catch our Chinese colleagues. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG Offerings Committee, chaired by Bethany Frew of NREL and co-chaired by Julia Matoibasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become members and get involved if you haven't already. Regarding logistics, I would ask you to note that the webinar will be an hour long. We will have a brief introduction followed by three individual presentations, and we plan to hold the questions for a 15-minute Q&A session after the last speaker. We've been trying something a little different for the Q&A recently. Attendees are requested to ask their questions through the Slido platform. You will not be able to ask your questions through WebEx. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter today's date, June 29, J-U-N-E 29, as the event code to ask questions of the panelists. Please note the person to whom you are addressing the question. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen in the webinar announcement at the bottom of the session information box on the website, and you will be reminded by the session chair during the webinar. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question to allow you to vote to help prioritize the question submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we will address them at the end. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with typically more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with June 29 as the code. Today, we're hosting the closing plenary session on forecasting and operation challenges during the coronavirus, which I think you will find very informative and timely. The session is chaired by Debbie Liu, an independent consultant, with Aidan Tui of EPRI serving as co-chair. Debbie had a long career at NREL and GE before starting her own business and is internationally recognized for her pioneering work on high penetration wind and solar integration studies. Aiden is a program manager for power system planning operations at EPRI with an international focus on renewables integration. Both are longtime contributors to ESIG. Debbie will manage the session logistics and Aiden will handle a special introduction and the Q&A. I've known both Debbie and Aiden and worked together with them for many years now and consider them both good friends. Debbie and Aiden, we appreciate having you here and I'll now turn it over to you, Debbie. Sure, thanks, Charlie. So um, welcome everyone to uh, the closing plenary session. We're really excited to have a, a worldwide um, um, session um, panel, session panelists today from the UK to Australia to the United States. And as you all know, with the coronavirus, uh, the level of uncertainty in planning operations has gone through the roof um, in terms of uh, what utilities are trying to manage on the power system. And we're going to be talking about how different utilities around the world are managing that today. So I'm going to um, first have Aiden, uh, program manager at EPRI, who's been there for the last decade, and also who manages the system operations uh, working group at EPRI, at ESIG, uh, give a uh, discussion of an overview of what's going on in the power industry with the coronavirus. So, Aiden, I'll turn it over to you.
Well, well, keeping safe. Um, what want to just give a, a few minutes background here to put some context of what some of the other folks will talk about um, with the, the pandemic and, and some of the things that we've seen um, in some of the work we've been looking at in EFRI. Um, so just as a background, um, once this started really um, becoming more worldwide in kind of early March, late February, we started getting a lot of questions and discussion from members to talk about what, what are the impacts on, on places like Italy that things were being, um, stuff was happening first and it was being hit hard first so that they could understand what the things they need to do um, in their system and as they operate the system. And, and that included both things like some of the demand impacts that I'll talk about in, the, in a few slides here. Um, as well as some other issues around how they actually operate the system. Um, there's potential challenges when you get to those low demands or, or potential changes in the demand profile um, around uh, how you actually can operate. You get high voltage conditions, you get changing power flows, those types of things, um, as well as the fact that uh, you have to maintain operator safety and um, make sure that your, your operators aren't uh, uh, compromised or your operations aren't compromised. And so there's different approaches for that in terms of the actual uh, sanitation, the health, and some of the kind of um, operations. So in some places, even as far as going to uh, sequestering employees on site so that they um, they aren't exposed to the virus. Um, so we we did some webcasts back in particularly March, April, early May um, around this. We ended up doing about 20 webcasts, and uh, across those webcasts, not not unique participants. We had over 70, 400 people got on the webcast. We often webcast 250, 300, even more people, um, talking about what they were doing. It would a particular focus on a lot of those safety aspects and making sure that people were sharing best practices and, and the types of things that were they were seeing in their region and what they were um, understanding was happening, um, as well as then some of these demand impacts and, and some of the mitigating practices. So we, we did look at this idea of kind of looking at across the world and just want to share a few insights here the first few minutes before handing it off to, um, to some of the other folks to talk about some things happening in their individual regions. So as I mentioned, Italy was one of the first places um, that, that was hit hard, as people are aware from the news. Um, so we started tracking there. And Italy probably had one of the more severe impacts on demand across any country um, from what we've seen. But um, this shows from some of the publicly available uh, NSOE data, um, the 2019 energy demand on a daily basis and the, and the 2020. So you can see, obviously, the, the weekdays and weekend uh, behavior there. Um, we didn't correct this for weather or anything, though we did check and the weather in these weeks wasn't particularly significant um, factor in the, in the Italian load, but we did see these kind of high high teens into the 20s and even maybe as far off as into the high 20s or 30s um, reduction in demand across the day. Um, we also saw when you look at that reduction in peaks that were kind of commensurate with that and, and also saw uh, changes in the load shape, which I think will be discussed in some of the other talks. and. Um, did see that there was uh, maybe later morning load rise in particular as um, as people's behavior was changed. Um, you'll also see there in Italy, Easter happened obviously at different weeks of the year, and so there's, it's harder to extract that towards the end of the April. But we have seen in a lot of these, they, these start to return as well. In the next slide here, I've got a short video that I think should hopefully um, display here that shows um, how some of the various regions, countries in Europe, uh, countries around the world, and then some of the ISOs here in North America. This is public data. We didn't do a whole lot of adjustments. So individual ISOs likely have more specific or, or accurate information that, that might be a, a little bit different than this. The, the idea here, though, was to try and give a general sense to take a particular region. Um, you can kind of see, as they say, the Italian load, you, you were up over that 20%. Spain we got up that high as well. Um, and then as we got into to May and April, it, it, some of the reductions were, or May and June, some of the reductions weren't quite as high. So um, we did see that. Um, we'll continue tracking how this plays out over the, the next few months as, as things ebb and flow um, and hopefully get better over time. Um, we also track places like China where we started seeing the load get back to normal. So um, do, do you want to uh, just mention that there is a lot of information up on the EPRI website that, that talks about this, and we have been looking at this in, a, in multiple ways, thinking about what does this mean for the future. Um, one of the big things is around how do we design a control center? What does that look like now that we know um, how severe pandemics can impact the system? And um, what does that mean in the short term, but also in the longer term for things like asset management strategies, um, outage planning, those types of issues? Um, health and disinfectant technologies are obviously going to be important. And then we do see that it's going to impact some of the decarbonization and carbon reduction goals. It's not clear exactly what, how positive or negative that's going to be, but there's no doubt that some of the 
structural changes in the economy as well as some of the more immediate economic impacts are going to have an impact and potentially then you see things like the green deal in europe where you've got these large reduction um, or decarbonization goals that, that are starting to come into play so um, all of this is changing how we think about the electric industry and we are starting to think more about how we have to make these changes happen and uh, what are the specific things that are going to be impacted when we think about COVID. but that, that's really a, a very quick way of, uh, of getting to set the scene certainly encourage any questions on, on slido as people are uh, are looking at this and, and let us know if you have any thoughts uh, otherwise debbie i'll look, hand it back to you sure thanks Aidan, for that um nice overview of, of what's going on as, as Aidan mentioned if you go to slido.com and use um hashtag june 29th you can enter in questions and you can also vote on questions so that um we can have the highest priority questions asked at the end of the um, four presentations. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce uh, Julian Leslie. He's the head of networks from um, the National Grid's electricity system operator, so from the UK. And um, Julian's got nearly 30 years of experience of transmission system operation, planning, and investment. He manages customer connections. Um, recommends transmission investments, manages the interfaces with other network owners, and is developing an operability strategy for um, the UK's zero carbon goals by 2025. So with that, Julian, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Debbie, thanks so much. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody on the call. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to speak to such a wide international audience today. I uh, just got a couple of slides just to build on what Aidan has just been talking talking around. Um, so here in Great Britain, uh, specifically, uh, this is a graph showing the percentage differences in demand at the various times of the day uh, and the evening. And you can see that the really biggest impact has been sort of close on a, at the worst time over the Easter break, nearly a 30% reduction in the morning pickup. Um, we think that's because people aren't going to work, they're getting up later, showering later, just having a more leisurely start to the day. Um, and you can see sort of the minimum impact is overnight, um, where there's been probably only a sort of 20% reduction or 10 to 15% reduction overnight. But when you look back, I mean, every day you can't really discern a difference between one day's demand profile and the other. But as you can see by this graph, ever since uh, the Easter holidays in mid-April, we've seen a gradual uh, sort of steady a reduction in the in the percentage decrease sort of day on day. Um, the bank holidays for us have been key um, with a huge reduction uh, getting towards the 25 percent. Now in GB we're, we're an island system we've got a peak demand of about 50 gigawatts. Um, at this time of year that we're seeing a peak in the day of around 25 26 gigawatts and overnight which has been our real concern. Uh, it doesn't show it on here, but that blue line represents a sort of a 13 gigawatt demand on the system, um, whereas normally we, we would never see anything less than sort of 16, 16 and a half gigawatts. So what we've had to do is work really hard this summer to see how we can get things like downward regulation, keep the inertia at the right level, and manage frequency response and the rock-off uh, rate of change of frequency situation in these very low demand periods. Um, but there's been some huge positives. Obviously, as a percentage, the number of the amount of renewables on the system is obviously much greater. Um, so we've we've met some of our records in terms of the amount of renewable on the system over the last three months, uh, which is obviously great and is really proving that we can operate a very very low carbon system. Um, and partially due to this, but partially due to the activities we've done anyway, we've we've now ran for. Well, it's, it's really three months without coal. We had a, a coal plant that came back from maintenance and had to run for two hours. We sort of broke the official record, but we've not needed coal in the system for, for over three months. And there's no reason to think why coal would ever come back onto the system unless we get into a cold winter and, and coal becomes back in merit. Um, and also for the consumer, the wholesale electricity costs are probably 20, 25% lower than they would be normally. Um, because we're relying so heavily on renewables and less so on gas. So some huge positives in the situation that we found ourselves in. However, as, as a system operator, there's some lots of good things as well. Um, obviously, a huge reduction in inertia on the system. Um, so we're having to buy uh, the worst situations, sort of 15 to 20 synchronous machines in the market. 
But in order to create the headroom together as machines on, we're having to constrain off interconnectors and renewables in order to create the space to bring on those 15 to 20 synchronous machines at, um, at minimum stable generation to provide the inertia. This is also leading to an increase in balancing costs. So in the UK, we're very heavily market driven. And these increasing costs, we were forecasting around £500 million pounds, uh, between the lockdown in, in March and when hopefully we come out of the lockdown towards the end of the summer in August. Um, so the £500 million has not quite transpired to be quite as high as that. Uh, but for example, Sunday just gone cost £11 million pounds just to manage one day on the system. So what have we done? Um, in order to give the, the control room operators the tool that they need, we've created a new market product. Um, what we found in the UK, the generation has moved from being transmission connected to a, a huge amount of distribution connected. Um, and we had no access to those um, generators in the market. But within 10 days, we created this new market to provide down regulation, which allows us to buy off the embedded generation or to buy on demand. And we launched it after about 10 days of designing it. And we now have over four gigawatts of a distributed generation that has not participated in any market ever before. And it's now working in a national market and gives us access to that four gigawatts of embedded generation to switch off to give us that down regulation space to bring on the conventional power plant. And partly as part of doing that, we also clarified the emergency inspection rights. So that the distribution network operators is very clear that they have the legal right that if, if instructed, then they can disconnect embedded generation. That is very much a last resort. And the market product I've just spoken about was our way to try and avoid doing the um, emergency disconnection. However, in the long term, to solve this, because I think we're just getting a glimmer of where we will be in sort of four or five years' time. So we've got other programs of work which are happening. So we've got a, a program that is replacing. Uh, the protection settings on over 50,000 embedded generators to remove the rate of change of frequency issue. Um, and we also have something called vector shift, a voltage uh, based form of protection which doesn't ride through the faults we'd like it to on a transmission, on a low carbon transmission system. So we're replacing those 50,000 sets of protection. Um, we're also procuring grid stability and inertia services in the market. So anybody who follows the GB, you'd have seen in January, we will, we procured um, 10 GBA seconds of inertia in the market, which I believe is one of the first in the world in order for us to do that. And we've just gone out again for our second round of products and product definition uh, for grid stability and inertia. And all of this is leading towards, as Debbie mentioned, um, that by 2025, that when the market delivers uh, as a zero carbon uh, result, that we as a system operator will be able to operate that system as zero carbon. So we won't need to bring on those 15 to 20 synchronous machines. We will just be able to have our inertia products, our frequency response products running on the system at zero megawatts, which is allowing us to operate the, the system at zero carbon. And we just got four years left to do that. So the, the new services developed for this summer, give us, giving us that insight as to what it's going to look like in three or four years' time, really giving us that assurance that the, the efforts we're making the new products are putting into the market to encourage the new technologies to provide us that stability and inertia. It's absolutely the right thing to be doing. And with that, I'll hand back to Debbie. Oh, thanks so much, Julian. That's really quite impressive what you've been able to do in a short amount of time. I'm going to use the session share prerogative just to ask a clarifying question. You mentioned that you um, are now able to have distributed resources provide downward capabilities. Are, are you doing that directly or through aggregators or how, how does that mechanism work? Uh, so this particular one here is through the distribution network operators. So at the moment we need to give a couple of three hours notice to the distribution network operators who then will ensure the disconnection happens and then we then the payment follows later. But we want to evolve the service so it becomes much more real time and we can go through aggregators or directly to the distribution energy resources uh, to take them off in the market. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to move on to uh, 
The next presentation from Australia, uh, Chart Vanderwalt is currently the group manager of the NEMS real-time operations at AMO. Uh, his responsibilities include managing the two NEM control rooms. He's an electrical engineer with 26 years of system operation experience, 13 of which was with ESCOM in South Africa and the rest in Australia. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chart. Uh, thank you very much, Debbie. Um, good morning, all. Good afternoon and good evening as well this morning. Yeah, and welcome to my presentation on the impact of COVID-19 on the Australian power system. As we currently speak, obviously COVID is, is still with us, um, and our direction in, in, in our control room is always been and has always been to keep the system secure and reliable, and to prepare for any eventuality. And we've done so, and through our planning. We're still keeping the, the power system secure and reliable. So from an EMA, EMA perspective, just as, as we're an independent market and system operator in Australia, um, we manage the eastern side of the power system. The western side is managed um, separately and it's a two distinct power systems. From the EMA's point of view, when we became aware, obviously, of the COVID situation, we had to plan on how it would impact our power system. The information we had internationally is it will impact demand as um, restrictions take place and businesses and people have to work from home and businesses slow down, you will have an impact on your reduction in demand. So we had to plan for that. Um, the next thing is we also had to look at how our transmission and generation assets would be impacted um, for this. And, and finally, how our control room staff would be impacted if any of them became positive for COVID and they had to be isolated or uh, others and so in Australia what happens is the government if you have an infection in a building then you have to evacuate the building the building has to be cleaned and that obviously will shut down our control room so we had to plan for that as well insofar as our TNSP and generation um, the biggest impacts on them would be uh, supply chain interruption and that's on generation and uh, TNSPs as a lot of our spares come from overseas. We're dependent on overseas deliveries, and if you have impact on your travel and air deliveries, you might impact on your power system, and that'll impact your ability to maintain the power system or even restore anything if it breaks. So, um, for control rooms for generators, what they what they did is they um, actually split their shifts in two to ensure that they have a uh, as I can put it, an uninfected shift. They also reviewed the minimum generation capabilities for our low demand periods that we might experience. Um, and at, some of them found that at this min demand, they might actually have um, exceeded the emission levels. And for that, we would have gotten um, EPA, the Environment, Environmental Protection Agency, dispensation. We might have to um, look for that. So far, we haven't had any of these issues, which is great. Um, what we also did for the potential closure, because we've got the biggest risk for a generator, is if, if they don't have any staff to man the power system or the, the actual generator. So what we determined from the EMS point of view is, is prioritize the minimum critical generation that we would need to run the power system. And in that scenario, down to generation level, they themselves identified what operational staff they would need to operate the um, nominated areas of the generator to keep it running. And in effect, that's worked. We have not had any impacts um, of, of staff in our control room from TNSPs or generators at this stage. I spoke a bit earlier about the, the impact on uh, supply chain um, and our, and our um, reliance on, on interstate because as you might know in Australia, we've also clamped down on interstate travel, um, and that would have impacted our ability as well. So the, the impact on plant outages was obviously a risk, um, and then and coming in summer, so in Australia, we've got a high summer and a summer peak, so we tend to, to defer our maintenance out of summer into your shoulder, into your winter period, um, where you can actually do this maintenance where your system is, is, is a bit more relaxed. Now, the problem is with the COVID, 
we um, shoulder period was maintenance was cut down and that would then lead to issues for us on later that I'll discuss in the next slide. Some of our participants, including the wind and solar farms, they also rely on interstate and international contractors to provide specialist um, maintenance activities, but there, there were restrictions, as I said, on our cross-border travel. Our AGD systems, um, as Baslink, as you may know, sometimes also have issues, and these we need overseas resources to fix. So if these things failed, we would have had some issues. Um, for instance, we get our cable from Pirelli in Italy, and the converter station, the technicians for that we get from Germany. Cable restrictions would have really um, constrained our ability. Many of our spare parts that we actually use on our transmission system are actually available in Australia, and um, we now also in Australia start to produce these ourselves. Uh, renewable generators, on the other hand, they in a good position that we are strong renewable in Australia, as you may know, and we do have a lot of spare parts. The issue with um, excuse me, the issue with the renewable generation is commissioning, um, and commissioning would have been hampered um, due to the fact that we, for commissioning, we use overseas personnel and specialists to can commission the equipment. Um, so commissioning has been hampered a bit of new equipment. To move on, as I mentioned, we've got fewer outages planned um, in comparison to previous years, and this is obviously due to, to um, the plans that staff, that uh, CNSPs and, and, and generators have made to, um, how can I say, spare their staff from, from going out there and, and running the risk of infection. Generators and transmission operators have also cancelled or deferred their outages or they have reduced the scope of their maintenance. And for example, the maintenance is being deferred for up to six months and units are operated at reduced output um, for, for that to happen. Now, the essential maintenance is still taking place um, and that has taken place and we've had outages for those. We haven't experienced any delays in, in planned outages or delays on returning um, broken down generators or equipment, unfortunately, as yet. So what we are envisaging is we might have some issues in our quarter three and quarter four when these outages now, when this transmission and generation participants, participants come to us with their outages. What we would need to do there and what we currently are doing already is coordinating with our TNSPs, our transmission network service providers, to actually um, ensure that the outages that we do don't conflict and do not put our system at risk. And we also do a projected assessment of system adequacy. It's where we look uh, two years ahead to see um, windows for maintenance for generation. And that includes looking at, at demand, obviously, and the generation planned outages for their maintenance. We've been sitting down with generation and discussing this with them and where we see uh, uh, concentration of generation outages, we've um, asked them to move the outages. We can, as an EMO, um, direct generators to move outages, but then um, so far that has not been required. We've not needed to do that at all. So, as I mentioned, Currently on our generation and transmission system, we've not had any major impacts. We've not had delays in returning of maintenance or actual broke, uh, broken down equipment. So that's been good. Um, and we also, quite honestly, as you might know from the, from the EPI presentation, we haven't had a big reduction in demand. Um, New South Wales, we're a very state-based power system. Uh, the power system grew in, that each, in each state. The power system grew itself and then they were connected. So we, in each state we have our system and then they're connected through interconnectors. In New South Wales, let's say about 7% reduction in the bond. Queensland, 8%. Victoria, 5 to 6%. Australia is the same as that. And Tasmania, about 5%. What did we do for that? We planned, obviously, as, as all system operators do, you plan for the worst contingency. Our minimum demand in um, in Australia was 
in the 10th November 2019, 458 megawatts. And at that stage, we needed to um, make extra plans. So what we did is we quickly looked at voltage control, how we do the voltage control, and how we would manage system strength when generators shut down due to the low demand. And we put plans in place for that. And so far, that's been working fine. We had no major issues. Excellent. Thanks, Debbie. Well, thank you very much, Chart, for that, um, for walking us through all of the complex considerations and mitigations with respect to the logistics and maintenance across the system. Um, that was quite informative. Um, I'd next like to turn it over to the New York ISO. Um, we have two presenters. Chuck Alonje is the manager for demand forecasting and analysis. Um, Chuck's group is responsible for short term and long term forecasting of New York state system loads. And um, he's going to be presenting this alongside Dave Edelson, um, who's a longtime ESIG contributor, uh, manager of operations performance and analysis. Um, and um, Dave is uh, responsible for validating New York ISO's wholesale day ahead real time energy markets. Um, so I'd like to uh, uh, change it over to, to Chuck to start us off. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, both Dave and I to this session. Uh, as Debbie mentioned, I'm Chuck Alonji. I'm the Demand Forecasting Manager here at the MISO. I'm joined by my one of my operational tag team partners, Dave Edelson. Uh, I'm going to start off the presentation talking about some of the demand impacts that we have modeled and assessed over the past uh, three months uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, induced shutdowns. Um, and some recent trends, and I'll also talk to some of the forecasting updates and challenges that we've uh, encountered along the way. So I want to start with just a cursory overview of the last three months. Uh, this chart gives everyone an overview of what the New York State energy production versus expected has been uh, since the first week of March. Uh, the blue, or sorry, the green bars show. <clears throat> What are uh, weather normalized deviations? So this is a uh, this is our current expected daily loads per day, averaged up to week, and then we're factoring in the impact of weather. Uh, once we take out the impact of weather, the remaining deficits we're largely attributing almost all of it to COVID-19. There is some randomness in the model, probably on the order of one percent, but this chart shows the first week of the shutdowns here in New York State. Um, that was the week beginning March 15th, uh, we immediately saw about a 4% reduction in daily energy use for that week. Uh, the following week, the shutdowns uh, continued and expanded in scope, the week of March 22nd. And that seemed to be where we stayed around 8% uh, relative up until recent weeks, the last three weeks with the phased reopenings of New York has seen some of the uh, energy come back. Um, in, in with respect to the long term, the, the long term three months, we were generally in the range of around six, or I'm sorry, around seven and a half to almost 9.7 percent uh, vacillating in that range uh, for much of the shutdowns. The reopenings really began in the first week of June upstate and then permeated uh, with phased businesses uh, reopening. Uh, so the past three weeks uh, have seen uh, demand rise uh, relative to expected. Still below, um, still below their normal levels, but uh, you know the week of six, June seventh, and the week of June fourteenth showed the four to six percent below. Uh, last week's numbers were still tabulating, but they're indicating uh, on around uh, minus four percent relative to expected. Again, this is daily energy and not and not peak. Um, this chart truly really shows uh, a tale of two states. And what I mean by that is New York City and Long Island, which are most heavily hit by the COVID-19 cases and uh, had the um, highest level of uh, shutdown and then therefore the slowest reopening, uh, have shown the largest deficits relative to expected. So what you're seeing here on this chart, New York City is the yellow line 
uh, they bottomed down around minus 16 percent relative to relative to expected over the past three months. Again, some some as things have reopened, uh, New York City uh, recently uh, entered into their second phase of reopening, where commercial businesses are starting to spin up again. Uh, they still haven't gone to restaurants and leisure, uh, but they are they are starting to reopen, and you're seeing that over the past two to three weeks. Um, last week, in particular, um, as the uh, as the commercial sector, professional services in particular, which is a big part of Manhattan, has uh, reopened. Uh, oh, and I want to also show in the gray line that uh, New York City and Long Island together uh, are also depressed relative to the uh, rest of the rest of the state. New, so in New York State in total is the what you're seeing in, is the blue line, and upstate New York, which is everything north of New York City. Um, having grown up in the Hudson Valley, which is just north of New York City, I never consider myself an upstate resident, but uh, for the purposes of this chart, I am. Um, <clears throat> And now that I live in the capital district, I definitely am in New York State. Uh, over uh, the over the three month period, uh, generally demand upstate range minus six percent below expected, and, and as as expected, with some of the reopenings has rebounded uh, over the past several weeks uh, to be around minus two percent is our latest estimated number. Um, statewide, again minus four to six percent where we currently were, and then vacillating minus eight percent. Uh, there are some offsetting effects here in this chart, which is interested in, in pointing out. New York, uh, New York City is very heavily commercial, uh, and as such, as the, as with respect to the NISO, or the NISO load area constructions has the highest commercial percentage, and therefore was most exposed to the COVID-19 shutdowns and cor corroborating demand impacts. Uh, however, uh, Long Island you had a similar commercial impact. Their, their percentage of commercial is not as high as New York City, but we saw some interesting patterns uh, throughout the day in, in the Long Island area is that residential use has, has the, in the residential sectors, although NISO doesn't measure that information directly in corroboration with our transmission owners, we have seen that the residential, residential energy use has increased throughout the midday. Um, and that it has some sort of, uh, that does have some compensating effect with respect to demand reductions uh, due to COVID-19 uh, for Long Island. And thus you can see the, the combination in New York City and Long Island, uh, there is some divergence there due to the uh, residential response. Okay, this is my last slide before I hand it off to Dave, but I really wanted to talk here about some of the forecasting challenges. So uh, on the top left shows the evolution of the diurnal deviations by month, starting off in March, we noticed, uh, as with many with many operating regions, the biggest impact due to the COVID-19 shutdowns was impacts to the morning ramp, and that's clear uh, from the March data, from the April April composite diurnal cycle, and the May composite diurnal deviations. Um, we really saw the pattern evolve uh, throughout this period, uh, amplifying. Uh, throughout the month of May, and now starting to uh, come back into what's what's more expected. The, uh, again, I mentioned the biggest impact is the, is the morning ramp and the morning pickup, but we are seeing some interesting changes around the, around the peak. And that's uh, the top right chart shows uh, what I like to refer to as the wedge. It shows the expected load for this time of year for that particular work week, uh, June 15th to June 20th. The blue line on the top right chart shows the actuals. So the forecasting challenge really has been modeling that wedge. How, how do you uh, correct for that? And several different operational forecasting techniques that have been applied has been updating the models to be aware of the COVID impact. Uh, so taking a look at the, uh, the, trend, the, the smoother weekly uh, trends in energy use and peak, and peak reduction, parameterizing that into the model and having it learn, uh, <clears throat> having it learn uh, what impacts are most strong during the time of the day. Other is roll, rolling bias correction. So that's really how uh, the NICE has been tackling that problem. Uh, we've also been tracking regional changes. Uh, as, as mentioned, different, different structural components of the New York load areas are more commercial versus residential versus industrial. Um, so when you see changes in base loads, you're looking at your heavy, your heavy commercials and your industrials uh, shutdowns and, and tracking that state, uh, region by region. Uh, and also uh, getting some knowledge into the 
scrolling bias corrections that you're putting into the model. Um, the bottom left is an interesting chart showing the uh, exemplifying the change in the in the morning ramp and then the evening peak and then the, the and then the demand decline throughout the throughout the late evening and early morning hours. Well, before the morning pickup, it shows some of the challenges. Uh, the, the, these, especially real-time models, uh, are really autoregressive, and they're heavily trained to look at the ramps at a specific time of day. So, again, when you when you're training for this, you have to make the models aware that there's this extra driver, but um, by hour of the day, and that is the the, the COVID impact due to the the, the shutdowns, uh, and then the rebound. So, not only are you sort of digging out the trough with respect to demand. Uh, deviations versus expected, you now need to educate the models on how you're coming back. Uh, and the best way to do that is frequent training. Um, you know, the NISO typically uh, trains its models uh, on a monthly basis or bi-monthly basis and looks to uh, de deploy into the into the operational environments. You know, this is something where you need to look at a more, more aggressive training stance as things evolve. Uh, so that's been uh, one of our lessons learned. And the other big lesson learned uh, over this period is looking at the weather and load sensitivity changes. It's not the same as folks are, uh, uh, as office buildings are starting to warm up here in the, nor in the, in the Northeast and, and in New York in particular, we had, a very, we had a very warm January, February, and March, and a colder than expected uh, April and May. Um, and towards the end of May and, and throughout June, now we're starting to get some of the, some of the uh, some of the first rounds of, of really warm weather, and we're tracking the response between load and weather and how that's changing. As buildings are uh, still open, but maybe not as many people, there's still air conditioning load, and uh, that needs to be uh, considered along with the in enhanced residential spots. So really tracking that weather load sensitivity is important. Uh, that's all I have. I'm gonna pass it over to Dave uh, to round out some of the operational uh, operating impacts. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, hopefully everybody could hear me okay. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night to everybody on this call. I know we have all the time zones covered. I'm going to keep it really brief so that we have more time for questions and answers. Um, again, my name is Dave Edelson. I'm also with the New York ISO. Um, around mid-March, uh, New York State was, uh, uh, COVID-19 was getting entrenched in New York State more than any other part of the United States. Um, the, the state really embarked on a very stringent lockdown. Uh, a lot of a lot of closures, um, businesses, commercial activities, all ground to a halt, schools shut down. Uh, the New York ISO was no exception. Um, so overnight, we had to convert our company, um, all of the non-operators, about 500 employees, from working in the office to overnight working from home, as many of you have also um, experienced. Uh, now, our operators, on the other hand, uh, very early on in, in uh, this entrenchment of COVID-19 in New York State, we decided to sequester our operators. Um, similar to the way I believe a uh, chart described for Australia, um, we divided our operators into two locations. We have a backup uh, primary and an alternate control center. So we divided our shifts into two locations uh, so that they minimize interactions uh, with uh, the number of people that they had to interact with. And then we created a voluntary program uh, to sequester operators. So operators signed up for this program. Uh, they would get tested for COVID-19 and uh, we brought on campers on site. Uh, so we, we signed up 30 operators, which is the equivalent of about four full shifts um, and put two shifts on one location and two shifts on another location. And for a period of eight weeks, uh, these 30 operators spent all their time on site. Uh, they would work their shifts. Uh, they had some personal space in their um, parking lot campers. Um, but it's a very stressful uh, situation. They're working more shifts than usual because we normally have 60 to 70 operators that are covering all of our 24 by 7 shifts. Uh, so it's fewer operators working more shifts, not seeing their family um, in, in, in a more stressful uh, environment, a foreign environment for them. Uh, so some of the ways we mitigated the strain of that sequestration was we made a voluntary program. Uh, we, we really had to plan for things we never thought about before. We had to uh, provide for entertainment. We had to provide for fitness, uh, and we did. We, we contracted that out as much as we could. Um, we had processes and procedures in place to receive care packages from families where that could be received safely. 
But other than that, the operators were completely isolated from anybody except for the 15 or so that they would see on a day-to-day -day basis on site, and that lasted for about two months. Um, as uh, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions have lifted a little bit in New York State, we've also lifted that sequestration. And now we still do maintain the two site locations so that we minimize interactions uh, and, and uh, potential transmission of the virus. Uh, but we do keep uh, one shift on one location, uh, a day shift on one location and a night shift on another location. Um, that allows for uh, cleaning and disinfecting, uh, disinfecting uh, the control room after each shift because there will be nobody in one control room for 12 hours of a day. Um, another point, I won't spend much time on the second challenge, generator and transmission maintenance deferrals, because uh, Chart covered that in great detail when he was talking about Australia. Um, and just like he is, we're accommodating, uh, we're mitigating that those impacts. We had a lot of deferrals because uh, the companies, the transmission owners and the generators didn't want to bring on contractors on site. Um, they were trying to do the same thing, minimize interactions with their operators and protect their staff. Um, so to accommodate that, we now have maintenance that's backlogged and uh, we are accommodating far more uh, outages than normal during the summer months. Um, as Chuck just went through, we've experienced significantly lower loads in New York State uh, throughout the, the period of time. Uh, that surprisingly hasn't caused us any operational issues, any reliability issues on our market. I'll, I'll attribute a couple of uh, points to why that might be. Um, New York is fortunate that we actually do have some market structures in place that in a sense lower min-gen levels, so our fleet of generators do have a lot of downward flexibility already. Um, and part of that is because we allow negative prices to occur. We do a five-minute dispatch, so um, they're incented to be flexible so that they can uh, essentially chase price and, and make money when it's attractive. And, and uh, not generate when the prices aren't attractive. Uh, we also have our renewable portfolio, our, our wind for the, for the most part, are um, dispatchable down. So that gives us a whole other fleet of resources that are flexible down when we see very low loads. Um, but one point about um, uh, low loads and voltage that we didn't see is this really um, hit us pretty hard during the uh, typically low load uh, spring season. There was definitely lower loads during the day, but our lowest loads where we normally see voltage issues or in the overnight hours, and the overnight hours didn't really experience as much of a degradation in, in demand as it, compared to what we'd normally expect in the overnight hours. So uh, it, it basically are any voltage uh, issues that we may have experienced are our typical low load, shoulder month, overnight, low load voltage issues. So nothing out of the ordinary there. Um, we do have one other aspect when, when Chuck was talking about all the, the forecasting challenges, we have a pretty healthy virtual trading uh, program in our markets whereby we can have traders um, uh, hedge day ahead positions uh, based on what they anticipate the real time conditions to be. So to the extent that we're having forecasting challenges, they help converge the day ahead commitment set to match uh, or, or more closely align with uh, uh, what actually occurs in real time. So that's also another benefit we have for our day ahead to real time transitions. Uh, finally, just real quick, uh, one other aspect of having 500 employees uh, working from home, our IT organizations working from home, we have had two significant software deployments since we've been in this mode. We're still working from home as a company for the most part. Um, we have never done significant deployments remotely. Uh, so the way we mitigated those um, any risks associated with doing that remotely is we did several practice deployments and test environments with video conferencing um, to make sure that they went off without a, without a hitch. We did it exactly as we would do it in production from home uh, before actually uh, practicing those in, in production as well. So that's just to give you a flavor of some of the, I mean, there are numerous other uh, impacts to our organization, but some of the more, um, I'd say, interesting ones to uh, maybe th this audience. And, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Debbie so we have some time for questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much, Dave, and thank you, Chuck, for um, delving into some of the details of um, load changes and operational impacts in New York. Um, again, please go to slido.com and um, enter in your questions, vote on questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Aiden to um, to actually ask the questions. Thanks, Debbie. Um, yeah, so so looking through here, and there's a, there's a few common themes kind of coming up. Um, one of the ones that's a little bit maybe more general um, would be the, the, just the, no, it's not a second one, I guess. Um, but got thought is another one, but um, the, the load characteristics and, and daily load profile, and, and there's a few other questions as well around kind of forecasting and, and how those have changed. So. Uh, maybe we'll start with, with Julian. Um, you know, how much has you showed some of the demand reduction, or you mentioned some of the demand reduction? Um, how much has the load shape changed as well, and has that caused challenges? And then, how have you been able to forecast that, and, and what have you been doing to, 
either update your forecasts. Uh, Chuck showed some some really interesting kind of approaches there. Maybe you could speak to that and, and then I'll have Chart sure. speak to it as well. So, I mean, the biggest change for us, I think, like elsewhere around the world, has just been that morning pickup. It's not been as rapid or as steep as it would be normally. So I think people obviously are just, if they've been furloughed or if they're working from home, they can get up a little bit later and don't have to rush and get the train. Um, so that's been the hardest thing to predict, I guess. Um, but we can't, but normally, as you know, we would use the same day last year or this time two years with the same weather. And obviously, we don't have that. Uh, but as we're into it now, using yesterday or the same day last week, we're sort of getting better and our tools are learning as well. We use a bit of machine learning to sort of help with our forecasting. So now as we're into this, they're getting better. But then as the government changes the lockdown restrictions, then you get a bit of a step change, which obviously the machine learning doesn't know or understand. So it's a constant iteration. Um, we still do use uh, four people manually to sort of forecast and, and do the generation dispatch. So they're getting the feel for the system and getting a feel for where it's going and having to manage that um, second by second, minute by minute. That makes sense. Um, uh, my, my chart, do you have any thoughts as well on the, the Australia experience? It's, it's, it's exactly the same as Julian, actually. Our late, uh, morning peak is now later. It's, it's a bit flatter, but we, we suspect that's people actually just getting up later. And, uh, and our afternoon peak is earlier. And we suspect that is travel. People don't have to travel, so they um, they actually just get up or from their desk, walk into the kitchen, and, and start what they're doing. Just as interesting, um, we are now using Google Mobile mobility data um, as a proxy for our residential activity to actually see how people move, so we can use that in our forecast. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Chuck, Dave, you guys covered the kind of change in the load and, and forecasting. I don't know if you do have anything else. You know, certainly. Come on off mute and, and let us know. Uh, nothing really to add. Uh, again, morning impact is our biggest, uh, along with uh, some changes in the midday and the afternoon. Um, the, uh, the, the biggest thing for us to keep watching is the change in weather response uh, as for, for New York in particular, as the warm season continues to evolve and how that impacts makes and how that imbues changes to both the the near term five minute forecasts or the near uh, the real auto regressive parts of the forecast and then the, the day ahead component um how does that change with uh the, with the increasing temperature makes sense yeah, I, know, I know we we've heard a lot about kind of people thinking through what when you got more people at home what does that mean with AC load during the summer that type of thing um, the, the next question was for Julian specifically, though there may be others have thoughts on as well. Um, when we think about those inertia services that you uh, that you mentioned being kind of more valuable, you know, what, what resources do you expect to be successful there, and, and how are they? Yeah, so it's a great question. So we did a short-term market, which had to be we we launched in December last year, and it had to be available for April next year. So just sort of 16 months for the delivery time. So the technologies that's come forward there are repurposed gas-fired power stations, which have just taken the generator off. So you can still spin the um, uh, spin the turbine and get that rotating mass on the system. Uh, the future contracts which need to be available by 2024, we expect that to be virtual synchronous machines from wind farms or wind farms combined with battery technology. We do expect uh, synchronous condensers, but also um, are expecting some sort of flywheel I know GE has a flywheel type product, so we're expecting to see some of that. Uh, but we're also finding people who can do compressed air. So the, the motors that compress the air are very good for inertia. They've got a lot of inertia constant with, with those machines as well. So I think as we go out to the market, I think we'll be really surprised at what they come back with. And it's really exciting to see the different range of technologies we might get, uh, all of which are zero megawatt at the time of use, but give us a, a huge inertia constant that we need to operate a safe and secure grid. Awesome. Uh, Ch Chair, you, you, you may also have thoughts on that, as well as kind of the next question around the, the, the low load and um, weak, weak grid and unanticipated low inertia. Is that something you've seen? And you know, what, what type of experiences have you found from that? Yes. So, um, like I said earlier, our, our region with the lowest demand and the, and the highest is the one that blacked out the South Australian region. We had a minimum demand there of 458 megawatts in November last year. We did studies now with the COVID for um, managing that system down to 200 megawatts, and there are definitely challenges. Um, what we found is with rooftop solar PV, 
we've actually put in place systems, and you might have seen that in the press, our government has now allowed that, that we can actually switch off rooftop solar when we go into that low demand um, situation, because you have to have a certain amount of synchronous generation online, or synchron synchronous. And we're currently, they're busy installing synchronous condensers, but they're not there yet, so until that, we need to bring down um, solar, PV solar, in, in those conditions. Yes, so it, it is a challenge. Um, you mentioned you're allowed to, have you actually activated that program chart much? Um, we, um, yes, so on a, on, a, on a Saturday, what happens is we, we will, in our pre-dispatch forecast, we look at the 48 hours ahead, and we will then see, okay, we're going to a low demand decision, um, 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 time. We will then inform our distribution distributor that we might have to, to use that. Um, we haven't used that in anger yet. Um, so we haven't needed to, to switch off the, the solar yet, but but it is there. Um, and what we're working on now is actually some, somebody else mentioned that um, systems to actually do that remotely, that that is the next step. That um, meters. I think, Julia, I think you guys are doing something similar as well, right? Yeah, when I'm going down to domestic level, at the moment it's one meg one above, but um, I'm sure we'll get to domestic level sooner or later. Yeah. Um, uh, Dave, Chuck, do you have any experience in terms of kind of some of these high renewable challenges and being, being illustrated more, or is there still not not the level there in New York, or what, what, are, you, what are you seeing in, in some of these issues with low demand? Yeah, I don't think our, our penetration is not there yet. We know we are we have uh, very um, clear legal mandates in the state that, that are going to be hitting us um, over the coming years uh, with targets for 2030 and then 2040. So uh, we're, we're mainly um, building up our flexibility, uh, developing market rules and trying to get our pricing structures right right now, uh, identifying all the gaps that we're going to need because uh, we haven't experienced it yet, but uh, we know probably within the next um, we'll start to see it in about five years because uh, the, these targets are going to start ramping up quite a bit in the next few years. Okay, thanks. So. Um, probably have time for maybe one more. Um, and I think that the next one here kind of covers a lot of the other questions. I think we, we, we've gotten kind of a lot around the forecasting and, and the demand, um, some of the high renewables issues. And then this, this one that Cameron asked around the long term with the, the changing generation profile. So as we do see, um, some of these changes happening. I guess from a system operator perspective, what, what, what are the kind of ways you're changing some of your planning processes to, to adapt to the immediate impacts of COVID, but also some of the kind of structural changes as well as the changes that we might see in, in renewables and other things? Is, is that something you started addressing yet? Is it, is it too soon? What, what, what have you been looking at? Um, I don't know, maybe Julian, we could start with you. Sure. Sure, I mean, this goes to the heart of our sort of zero carbon operation by 2025. And uh, we've been working on that program probably for three years or so. Um, so sort of the grid system operation, sort of real time operational part. But in the longer term planning, moving to more probabilistic assessments to drive network investment, moving away from a deterministic sort of security and quality supply standard. So it affects everything from 10, 15 years out, planning which new investment we need on the grid system right the way through to the real-time operation and ensuring you've got enough uh, grid system inertia and short circuit infeed and all of the great things you need to have a safe and secure system. So it really has impacted every corner of our business as to how we operate the system. And is the, the COVID-19 itself, is that impacting in, in any sense of just getting there sooner or is that? Yeah, so I think what it has done is it's shown us how we can operate the grid system at, for us very low demands at around 13 gigawatts. Uh, 13 gigawatts, um, which, as I said earlier, prior to this, we thought 16 gigawatts was a challenge. So uh, being able to operate at these very low demands, giving us the confidence, um, seeing how the market responds to those, how it responds to negative pricing, how that's driving consumer behavior. We've got some agile consumer tariffs, which pay people to charge their electric vehicle or to do their dishwashing and washing machine overnight or during the day whenever the price is low. It's, it's only small at the moment, but that's only going to grow as people realize there's money to be made out of consuming electricity on a Sunday afternoon. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Chert, I know you guys are also dealing with some of the same issues. Is, is the COVID piece illustrating any of those more extremely or more, more significantly? Um, no, quite honestly, not, not significantly. It's, it's, it's only showing us how to manage when we don't have the generation anymore and then what to do in 
those situations. That, that's exactly what it's doing, like I said earlier with my, my previous answer. It's just accelerating our knowledge in that and managing with our PCs. Excellent. Chuck and Dave, I know you're more on the, the operational side. Any, any thoughts around how this is impacting some of your planning processes? Uh, yeah, this is Chuck. I can give a, just a, uh, a brief overview. We are looking at the uh, impacts to uh, New York State energy efficiency programs. Um, New York has an aggressive electrification program uh, toward moving towards 2050. Uh, that's not really our focus, but we are focused on looking at the change to energy efficiency programs and how that may uh, be changing the, the near-term load profile versus our original forecasts. Um, and also we're looking at the installation of, uh, we have a lot of behind the meter solar PV in New York State. Uh, it's about 2000 megawatts uh, as, of, as of this point. And uh, we're looking at how that glide path has changed uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, we're also looking at electric vehicle penetration and how that's changing uh, due to the economic conditions. So those are, those are three areas uh, of, uh, aside from looking at the economic impacts uh, on, from a system planning perspective that we're looking at uh, due to COVID-19. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, we, we, we've certainly seen similar things as we talk to, to utilities across the world around some of these structural changes that are happening as well as just the more immediate economic impacts and stuff. Um, certainly something that I think will have to be watched going forward in terms of what this means for planning. Um, looking through the questions, I think a lot of the other ones are around some of these inertia issues, weak grid and um, some of the capabilities that might be needed. So I, th I feel like we've covered most of them. Um, I don't know if, if any of the folks um, from the panel want to add any additional thoughts on any of the questions they're seeing, but otherwise maybe we can start to uh, finish off, Debbie. Um, sure, yeah, were there any last um, thoughts that anyone wanted to quickly give? Um, let's start, yeah. So there was a question about accuracy of our forecast. Um, in the long term. We do publish a document on our website. Um, if you just go to our website, aemo.com, you, you will find it there on our forecast accuracy. But um, for 19, it was below 5%. Yeah, Chuck, anything else from anyone? Or should I wrap it up? Okay, realizing that we're at the top of the hour, um, I really would like to thank everyone for a set of fantastic presentations today. And thank everyone who's on the phone for your participation. It's been a really timely and interesting session and provide some good insights and food for thought for all of us. Uh, and with this, we're um, bringing the forecasting and markets conference to an end. Um, hopefully it provided some useful nuggets for um, those of you at home. And I'd like to give a final plug that um, there is a monthly webinar um, scheduled, uh, well, it's scheduled for June, but it's gonna be on July 1st, and it's gonna be Caitlin Murphy from NREL, and she's gonna talk about end use electrification as a source of system flexibility, and you can go to the ESIG website and register. Everyone's invited to attend, it's a free webinar. And once again, thank you all for your participation. Stay safe and look forward to seeing you in the future. Take care, bye.